Uh, I can just inform you in advance, but you should not. I'm going to just start the meeting and then you're going to just go based on the order of the slides and you should not wait for me as a coordinator to just ask you to go to the next slide, uh, to just go to the next section. I'll communicate in the chat privately to each presenter, then you can start. Okay, I'm not able to control your slide. I can't. Hit. I will control the slides. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, please let's, we have 11 now here, right? Uh, yeah, well, there's four in the waiting room for potential students. Yes, please. All right, I'll go ahead and let them in. Hello, everyone. Jasmine, all they are in? Yes, they are all in. Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Today, we're going to just have the uh, overview of uh, information session about the doctoral program at uh, the IA school at the University of South Carolina. I am Hassan Mohammadi. I am associate professor here at the IS School, and I am uh, the chair of the research and doctoral committee. Uh, I want to just start the meeting, and I want to start the meeting with uh, an agenda. Uh, we have uh, uh, just started with the welcoming to everyone to this session. Uh, and then uh, uh, Jasmine Blackwell uh, gonna talk about the PhD admission overview. Then uh, members of research and doctoral committee, thank you very much, Dr. Rachel William, Dr. Liz Harnett, and Dr. Feli Tukifner. They will talk about the PhD program overview. Uh. And Finally, then we're going to go to the student services. Aline is going to talk about what a student services can help us. And at the end, we are open to question and answer. And not only the research and doctoral committees, the other faculty members like Dr. Vanessa Kitzi, Dr. Darren Frank Freeberg, they'll join us and uh, we are in a friendly environment, going to chat about the PhD program here at the IA school. Uh, Jasmine, I would appreciate it if you mute uh, all the attendees except the presenter. Uh, and uh, Jasmine, please go ahead and just start your presentation. I will navigate slides. Just let me know uh, how, when you're going to just move to the next slide. All right, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Hello, everyone. Um, the next one, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Blackwell. I am the manager of student recruitment here um, at the College of Information and Communications. And today I will be talking about the PhD admissions. Um, so, one thing to know, which is very important, is the GRE is not required for admissions for this program. So your admission decision will be based off of the other components that I will speak about um, in the application process. Um, so one thing you do want to have first off is a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university or the equivalency to one. Um, and if you have also a master's degree, it would also need to be the equivalency of a um, uh, from an institution here as well. Um, now, because we don't require the GRE, the things that you will need are your transcripts, 
So you will need your transcripts from all of your previous institutions. So one thing that is important to remember is you want to request um, all of your transcripts. So if you even went to a school just for um, one semester and took a school there and completed it or a course there and completed it, you do want to make sure that you request all of those transcripts um, so that there won't be any holdups in your application process. Um, you can request the unofficial transcripts. And okay. Okay. You are able to request your unofficial transcripts um, and you can actually put your unofficial transcripts on your application, which I would strongly suggest um, if you don't have one at the time that you have your at, that you can submit your application, but you get it at a later time, you can always send it to me and then I can upload it into your application. And then you would also want to request those officials. Um, the officials can be requested from that from your school and then you will send them to USD. Um, I always like to suggest the electronic version if possible, only because that is a faster method, but you're more than welcome to request the mailed version as well. And you will need those unofficials if you actually accept the admission and get matriculated into the program. Um, you will also need to have at least a great a GPA of a 3.0 on a 4.0 scale. Um, if you have any questions regarding your grade point average or you may not be there, um, we do have ways around that. So just reach out to me with any additional questions about the GPA. Um, we also would like a copy of your resume or your CV, and this is so that we can get an overview of your educational and professional experience that you have. Um, and so when it comes down to the application, there's going to be kind of a two-part application. So the first thing that you will do is the graduate school online application. So that will just be the general um, application for the graduate school. And then you will do an iSchool supplemental application. And in that application, there's going to be a, a couple of essay questions that you will answer, which gives us an overview of your interest in the program and some things that you, you know, your out, over outcomes on what you will want to learn. Um, the good thing about the application for the fall 2024 uh, semester is that there are no graduation gradu uh, application fees. So you don't have to worry about that $50. All the graduate fees are weighed for that fall 2024 term. So great, great time on wanting to come in if you are wanting to, you know, get that application done. Um, the next thing that you will need is going to be your statement of purpose. And that's just going to be a written statement that, um, kind of explains your research focus and your interest into the program. So that is one thing that you will also attach. And then you will also need three letters of recommendations. Um, the letters of recommendations are to talk about your job and or your academic experience. So you do want to reach out to individuals who can really uh, talk to your performance um, and give us an opportunity to know who you are. Um, I would suggest reaching out to previous professors, um, advisors, someone who, do, who can really speak to you. Um, so you would need three letters of recommendations. And then the last thing that you would need are your English proficiency exam scores if you are an international student. Um, now, if you have any questions about um, the scores, please let me know. Um, there is an exemption list for certain countries. And then if you also receive your um, undergraduate or graduate degree, or so your bachelor's or your master's from a school in the United States, um, then you are also exempt. So if you do have any questions about, you know, the the countries that are on that list, please reach out to me with any further questions. And you can go to the next slide. Now, um, the deadline to apply for the PhD program will be January 15th. Um, this program is a program that we only admit for the fall semester only. So January 15th will be that deadline. Um, and what happens after you submit your application and all the documents that go along with the application, your application will then get reviewed by our PhD admissions 
committee. Um, they will review your application and all the documents that I just talked about, and then they'll make that decision. And your decision will normally be released to you in late February. So um, application turned in by January 15th, and you should hear something back by late February on um, the decision to be admitted into the program. Um, all of your app, all admitted applications will be considered for a competitive funding unless you don't need any funding. Um, there are normally typically three different types of funding that you are able to receive. Um, one is going to be a graduate assistantship, and this is um, the, the main one if you are looking for um, some funding. There is also a tuition stipend and then also a full cost of student health insurance. So with that graduate assistantship, uh, once you complete that application, once you get into the program, then you will be able to talk about the options on how you are able to receive that during your first year. And you can go to the next slide. And now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the program cost. So right here, you will see this chart, and it does explain the program cost per credit hour. Um, so as you can see, um, and for example, if you are a resident of South Carolina, the cost per credit hour is $572.25. So if you wanted to get your total program cost of how much the grad program will cost, you would just multiply that number by 54 because there are 54 credit hours in the program. And so um, one thing to know is if you do receive that graduate assistantship that I did talk about, then your, uh, your tuition fee will go down to the South Carolina resident cost. So that will save you a good amount of tuition, um, a, a good amount of money on your tuition if you are to receive that. Um, there are some other costs here. Um, that, and then there are other ways that you are able to save money. So there are some outside scholarships that I can speak to you about and other things, um, you know, if you are looking for additional funding for your tuition. Um, but this is just an overall review of how the PhD program will cost. Um, there is a one-time matriculation fee of $80, and then that is only charged once. And then there's also a technology fee of $17. So this gives the program costs. Um, and then those are also all of the admission requirements. Um, if you do have any additional questions and you, you know, want detailed questions about what may need uh, to happen for your application or any questions regarding your transcripts um, or any types of ways for you to save money, please reach out to me um, and I will, I will be able to give you my information at the end. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Please let me know if not. Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel Williams, and I'm going to kick things off for us as we talk about the PhD program overview. So focusing on the milestones or the highlights for what you can expect in our doctoral program. Uh, next slide. All righty. So um, during year one, um, you're going to, first off, before you even start the program, you're going to be uh, assigned an interim advisor. And this is the person that will kind of usher you into the program and connect with you right away so that you don't feel like you're all alone as you start the program. Uh, in addition to being assigned that interim advisor, you are going to uh, participate in an orientation that's typically uh, right at the beginning of the fall semester, a couple days before classes start to um, get you oriented to the program and so you can meet your uh, fellow doctoral cohort folks. Um, one thing I do want to note is that we have a doctoral handbook that goes into uh, all kinds of detail about everything that you can expect with the program. Um, as a new faculty member, I've been reading through that handbook as well. Uh, it's something that we revise every year. We're in the process of revising it right now. So uh, you'll get the up-to-date, shiny, revised handbook before you start the program, but you can always refer to that for any information that we go over today. Um, so uh, after you know the summer for your program, um, during the fall for the program, uh, you'll start off on your coursework, which is really kind of the first big chunk of uh, the, the doctoral journey. Um, you are required to start out by taking uh, ISVI 801, which is research issues in library and information science. Um, other than that, you do have additional uh, required classes that you'll take, uh, but you can take those uh, in 
you know, whatever order makes sense for you and what's offered during the semester. Uh, nine credit hours or three classes is considered full time. So uh, in addition to the required um, courses in our program, you may also uh, take some electives as well. So this is sort of a sample of what fall and spring for your first year could look like um, if you were to start the program next fall. Uh, next slide, please. Alrighty, so to dig into the classes just a little bit more, um, in terms of the course requirements, we actually have 54 required course credits, uh, but 15 of those are those required uh, core courses. So um, it's ISEI 801, 802, 803, 804, and 805. Um, 803 and 805 alternate, so you'll kind of have to keep an eye out for when those are offered so that you can be sure to get those into your course rotation. Um, that's definitely something that your advisor can help you out with. Uh, in addition to that, you'll need to take six credits or two, um, two courses worth of qualitative and quantitative uh, methods courses. Those are typically offered outside the department, um, but offer some uh, targeted methods courses uh, in qualitative and quantitative methods to really get you focused on the kinds of uh, methods that you might want to use for your research. Uh, then you'll have 12 credits of electives, which or any number of approved 700 and 800 level courses. Again, it will depend on your interest, what's available, uh, and your conversation with your advisor. Um, and then we also have nine credits uh, in an area other than our discipline. Uh, one um, tip to find classes uh, outside the discipline is to kind of look and see whether there's some um, certificates that might be of interest to you because that's a great way to take advantage of courses outside of our discipline is to also get a certificate. Uh, and then once you complete your comprehensive exams, you will take 12 credits uh, worth of dissertation prep, which is just $8.99 to ensure that you're still enrolled as you're completing your dissertation. So that's sort of a quick overview of the first year and the courses, um, but I will turn it over to Dr. Liz Hartnett, who will continue on with program expectations. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, so as she mentioned, I'll be going, moving on from talking about coursework to running through a few of the requirements um, and milestones that you'll uh, have to meet in addition to coursework. As she mentioned, the first year of the program, you'll be focusing on your coursework. And starting in the second year, we start to add in some other requirements. So the first um, thing that we add is the annual review. And that will happen in the fall of your second year. And this is just a way for us to keep um, keep track of your progress and make sure that you're um, uh, keeping up with uh, with your plan and moving along as you as you'd like to do. So the annual review is really a report from you. There's a form um, online form that you fill out that's very detailed and asks you to report on. Uh, your, what courses you've completed, as well as any kind of research activities or writing that you're doing. Have you had any publications in the past year? Um, any any honors or awards? Have you been teaching? Um, that all those sorts of things that um, doctoral students do. So it's a great idea to start um, right at the beginning, keeping track of all of those things so that your annual review is very easy to write up. The, your advisor will uh, contribute to your annual review and discuss it with you and um, uh, compile a bit of a report uh, which, to add to yours, which is sent to our committee. Um, and then we, in turn, um, respond with a letter with recommendations for um, ways that you, what you might need to focus on in the coming year or, or areas that you might wanna um, pay a little more attention to based on your um, report. So it's intended to be helpful and it does help us uh, keep up with everyone's progress. Um, then the next thing that we add in, and this comes, uh, this may be, might be year three or it might be the end of year two, depending on how um, many courses you're taking at a time. But the qualifying exam is really not an exam ex in, um, exactly, uh, but it's more um, a way that you are demonstrating to us that you are able to um, engage in research, conduct research, and report on your research. So um, it, it, 
is uh, composed of just a full paper or proceeding that's been uh, accepted to a peer reviewed journal or a conference or presenting such a paper at a conference. So this can be done, um, it can be done anytime. Um, it, it says post course, post coursework and it can be done right after you finish your coursework. But of course the project should probably be ongoing and in, in the works as you're finishing up your coursework. So um, it, it varies. Uh, when people do their qualifying exam, but you do need to do it promptly after completing your coursework. And the link here is for the um, qualifying, the, um, all, the, all the forms that you need as you were going through this process. You'll see in our PhD handbook, there are some milestones pages that also include the activities for each year, as well as what, which of these forms are required um, along with those activities. Okay, let's have a next slide, please. Okay, so after you complete the qualifying exam and you've completed your coursework, then you're ready to take the comprehensive exam. And oftentimes the comprehensive exam is taken um, the semester after you finish your coursework. So the next the next semester or within about six months of finishing your coursework, it, you have up to a year to um, complete the comprehensive exam. So this comprehensive exam is our way of um, ensuring that you're ready to write a dissertation, basically, that you have enough of a handle on your subject matter and your um, knowledge is broad enough that you're going to be able to um, focus in and, and write a good dissertation. The first uh, step in that process would be to um, assemble your committee. You need a committee for your um, comps. Um, you'll appoint a chair and um, and a, a committee of at least three members. And one member has to be outside of the iSchool. So it could be a, a, another area that you're, that um, relates to your research. You know, you may be um, looking at uh, computer science um, uh, faculty as a, your outside member, someone like that, who you feel could um, contribute to, uh, you know, helping you do do your best on your dissertation. Um, then, and the chair can be your interim advisor, um, or a completely different person. It, it, it depends on how um, how things have worked with your interim advisor and whether you uh, decide to continue working with that person. Uh, the chair and the student work together to develop the questions for the um, comprehensive exam and a reading list, and the committee writes the questions. So um, there are six questions. Uh, four are related to theory, two for library and information science theory, and then two for outside theories that you're going to pull in and use in your dissertation work or that we relate to your topic. And then uh, two questions about research methods. So the exam has two parts of written. The written part is um, a minimum of 30 pages. So 10, 10 pages, no, five to 10 pages per question. And you have one month to work on your um, written exam. And two weeks after that is submitted, you'll have the oral exam where you you get together with your committee and discuss the the, pay, the um, exam questions and your answers. And then they decide whether you have passed. And if you have passed the comprehensive exam, then you move from being a doctoral student to a doctoral candidate. So it's a very happy day. And then you're, you're all you have left is the dissertation, and I will pass this to Dr. To Kiefner, who will tell you about that dissertation process. Hello. Okay. Okay. Um, this is exciting, isn't it? It is your last step. If you wanted to finish your doctoral study, you have to complete your dissertation successfully. There are two steps for dissertating process. <coughs> Sorry. So the first step is you need to create a proposal. <coughs> Sorry, it's, and I have a little allergy problem. 
first of all, you need to choose a topic that you feel very near, dear to your heart. That's why your committee um, has professors and outside of LIS discipline. It's just because only a doctoral students who will know the topic and, and the subject area that very close to the research interest. That's the reason, and I hope that you will work with your committee to consider a topic. Usually, a doctoral student, after finish the qual uh, qualification ex uh, comprehensive exam, you will have six to 12 months to defend your proposal. Yes, you are not writing the full paper yet. So first, a student needed to pass the proposal defense within six to 12 months. Um, so after the qualification exam, you will be registered for uh, ISI A99 course. So uh, is my, is my, is my microphone working? And I just saw this on the uh, chat. Is my microphone working? Please let me know, okay? So, okay, great. Um, so you will have six to 12 months to create a proposal. And then you will need to successfully defend your proposal, okay, with your committee. And the uh, process of defending your proposal is clearly um, defined in the uh, doctoral handbook. So once you got admitted, the doctoral handbook is one of the most important documents for you to consult. So make sure that every new student, the first thing is to go over the handbook and make sure you are familiar with every step of your study. Um, you have already heard from the previous presenter about the milestone. We have two charts to uh, define every stage of your study. And those two charts are very useful. So let's just say you will be successfully defend your dissertation proposal within six to 12 months. So afterward, your status will be changed to a doctoral candidate, okay? Not the before, it's after. So, and then uh, afterward, you will need to resubmit the doctoral committee appointment form. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that you cannot change the committee. If you wanted to, yes, you may, okay? So it is the doctoral student's um, right to, to choose the member who will uh, help you complete this important task, okay? This is a very important. However, if you could not successfully defend your uh, proposal, your status will, will be changed to be on probation. So at this point, you will not be able to register to uh, ISI A99 course. That's the, the, that's the dissertation preparation hour class. So be aware of that. Um, so if so after you successfully de defend your proposal, you have a minimum of 12 hours of ISI A99 course and and the students may fill out the dissertation fellowship form to receive a fellowship of up to 
$500 to support your, your dissertation research. So uh, every doctoral candidate needed to submit a copy of the final completed dissertation draft um, uh, to the doctoral committee to review be before you will defend your dissertation. And at least you will need to give um, the committee member at least one month to review your uh, paper, then sub out the days for final e uh, examination. So this is basically a, a dissertation process, but and I hope that it is important for every doctoral students in our school will make sure to feel familiar with all the uh, all the information in the doctoral handbook, and you will and you can find a form page link on this slide. You will find all the forms, um, and I think. Your journey is approaching to the end, but I but I wanted to say that at the uh, at the I school, you will have a lot of uh, faculties to support you to go over this journey, to help you uh, solve problem, to guide your research. So, but this last process will actually de define your status as an independent researcher. So, and I think it's, it's very excited to see every student succeed. So, um, so, and I hope that some of you will join iSchool and, uh, and uh, let uh, us to work with you so we will be able to help you complete this journey. So next slide, I will give it to the student services. Hi, my name is Ellen DeMonico. I'm the graduate student services manager here in the iSchool. Um, so we have an office here where we work with all of our, um, all graduate students. So our master students, but then also the PhD students as well. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so we're here to support you. As you heard, you get a lot of support from your faculty um, and that is absolutely so important. Um, so we're here just kind of as an extra office for you, anything else you might need. Um, some of these things that I've listed here that we can help you with, filling out required paperwork. Um, we made an internal file to keep track of your paperwork and assist with university forms. Those all kind of go together. Um, there's going to be a lot of forms that you fill out here um, as a as a graduate student, both for the university, for the graduate school, um, for the the doctoral program here. Um, and so we can help you with those. If you ever don't know where to go to get a signature, it's asking for the director's signature, for the grad school dean's signature, any of that kind of stuff. Um, we would be the place that you would go and we can kind of collect all those for you. And then we do keep an internal file, like it says there, um, just to keep track of all of those things, just as a you know, an extra safety precaution. You submit it somewhere, something gets lost somewhere, we'll always have a record of it. So we can have it and say, no, we really did submit it. Um, so we help with all of that. Um, any other kind of like university forms, I've helped students, you know, if they had to get into a class late, there's a form you have to sign for it um, or something like that. So lots of forms here. Um, we can also assist with course registration, less so with the advising you on which courses to take. That's more going to come from your um, your faculty advisor, but the actual course registration process, if you run into an issue, um, you're getting a restriction on a class, um, maybe, you know, one of those classes outside of our department you're taking for your um, methods or for your cognate or something, and you have to get an override for that, we can assist with that. Um, or 
excuse me, any kind of holds you might have on your account. Um, we can't lift all of the holds, but we can tell you where to go. Um, so any kind of course registration issues, you're not sure what section to register for, we can help you with that. Um, we also will send out a lot of important deadlines, um, reminders about important deadlines and milestones. So you'll get a lot of emails, um, both from us, from our office, and from you know, your advisor and from faculty and just kind of everyone around the school. Um, a lot of emails to keep track of, but they're all really important information. So we'll send out important reminders about, you know, upcoming deadlines, when registration is coming up, when the, the tuition payment deadline is coming up, um, graduation application, all that kind of stuff. We'll make sure to send out reminders to you. Um, and then we also direct you to resources around campus. There's um, a lot of offices um, around campus that you can you might need to go to, and we'll talk about a couple of them a little bit later on in the presentation. But if you're ever not sure where to go, we can direct you to that. Um, we're pretty good navigators of the campus. Our um, website, the South Carolina website, sc.edu, is actually pretty functional. It's a pretty great website. Um, I've been on some other school websites that aren't as good, but our search function um, is really, really helpful. That's where I go to find a lot of the stuff. So we can kind of help you track down, you know, what office you have to reach out to, who you have to talk to um, to get something done. Next slide, please. So Jasmine already talked a little bit about assistantships, um, so I'm just going to kind of mimic some of the things that she already said, but um, there are some graduate assistantships that are available by application. Um, if you do receive um, an assistantship, it usually comes with a stipend um, of $20,000. It was Fifteen um, before, but it is it is now bumped up to twenty um, for the academic year, and you work twenty hours per week. Um, it comes with a tuition supplement that is split between fall and spring. Um, as Jasmine mentioned, if you are a non-resident um, and you receive a graduate assistantship, you do get the tuition exemption to make up the difference. So you're essentially paying the resident rate as non-resident. So that's pretty good. Um, and then they will come with health insurance as well, the university health insurance. Um, so that can be, you know, a really great cost savings as well. Um, the application process used to be housed fully in our office. Um, we are now splitting that with the director as well. So if you are doing an assistantship, you will talk a lot with our um, director of the iSchool, Dr. Lida McCartan, um, but we will also help with kind of the paperwork side, as I mentioned, and then any questions you have, if you're not sure where to go to, can always come to us as well. Next slide. Um, in addition to assistantships, there are also several fellowships that are available to PhD students. Um, I believe you'll be getting a copy of these slides, so I've linked a couple of them on there and just our general fellowships website. There's more out there than the three I have listed here. I just kind of wanted to highlight a couple of them. Um, so there's the Rising Star Fellowship. This is for students coming from an HBCU that are interested in pursuing graduate studies at the University of South Carolina, and that's going to be a $10,000 stipend per year for four years for PhD students, so $40,000 total. Um, there's the Presidential Fellowship. Um, that is something that you are nominated for by um, the committee here in the iSchool. Um, and that is also for $40,000 over four years. Um, or the um, Grace Jordan McFadden Professors Program. Um, this is uh, specifically for underrepresented students students in PhD or MFA programs. Again, $10,000 stipend per year. Um, like I said, there are other um, fellowships out there on that link. Same thing on the South Carolina website. If you go to sc.edu and just search graduate fellowships, the whole website will come up. And that's where you can find a lot of information about the different ones, um, how much they are. Are they, you know, annual? Are they a one-time thing? Um, do you have them for your four years, like a couple of them on here, or are they just one time? Um, do you apply for them or are you nominated? Um, what other ones are out there? So there's lots of information out there on the website. So I do definitely recommend if you're interested, taking a look and kind of seeing um, what's available. There's a good mix out there. Uh, next slide, please. And then I also wanted to just kind of highlight some common resources for our students, um, some things that you might use, you know, if you decide to come here, um, things that all of our students are, are probably end up getting familiar with. So student health services, again, these will all link you to their um, websites, but um, student health services, they pretty much do everything. We have a, a fairly new health center on campus in the last um, couple of years pretty pretty. Um, they've got lots of stuff there. You can do all of your appointments there, um, get any immunizations, um, labs, they have women's health, immunization, or I said immunization, primary care, labs, all that kind of stuff. They have a pharmacy. Um, you can do um, lots of stuff there, really. So 
Um, they are also closely related to and they house our counseling and psychiatry, um, which is the next part I have on there. So we do offer here at the university a wide variety of counseling and psychiatry options. You can get some individual um, you know, counseling appointments if that's what you need. Um, that's, I believe, looped in with your student health services fee that you pay as a student. Um, if you pay that, so or under, if you're on the health insurance, that can cover it too. Um, so you can get some individual appointments, but they have a lot more than just individual appointments. They've really ramped up um, their offering. So they have a lot of groups um, for students, whether they are support groups, grief groups, skill building groups. Um, they kind of change by semester. They have some that are offered all the time, but if they see a, a need for students, they'll offer a couple different kinds of groups. Um, they have a lot of online resources as well. They have a new um, programming called Thrive at Carolina, which is a 24 seven support line. Um, so you can get access to anything that you need. Um, they have some um, educational sessions that they'll do online as well. Um, if you just kind of want to, you know, learn a little bit more about um, some, some toolboxes for yourself, build a toolbox for yourself, they have those mindfulness programs. They do a lot of suicide prevention as well. So um, really, really great. Uh, definitely, definitely recommend checking them out. Um, next one on there, we have our writing center, which I think a lot of people think of as just for undergraduate students, but graduate students as well. Um, that is right there on their website that they can assist with um, if, if they were writing a thesis or dissertation. They're not going to do any kind of like editing, but they can be helpful um, just to kind of maybe bounce some ideas off of. They will do um, in-person appointments or virtual appointments, um, or you can do kind of a drop-off service where you drop something off and they'll give you some comments and some edits. So they can be really, really helpful. Um, or maybe if, if your courses have any papers and you're getting some feedback, the Writing Center is, is wonderful. Um, financial aid, if you are using loans um, to pay for any of your school, this is an office that you will become very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, our financial aid office, that's where you'll go if you have any questions about your financial aid. One thing that you might get um, you know, tied in between us and financial aid is um, there's this thing called CPOS, Course Program of Study, where um, you know they want to make sure that you're using your financial aid for classes that are applicable in your degree, so you're not taking classes that aren't applicable and and um, taking out loans for things that you don't need. Um, and so they they monitor that using an online degree auditing system called DegreeWorks. Um, and since it's a computer program, sometimes things mess up. So if you ever get a you know an issue of you're taking this class and it's just not showing in your degree for whatever reason, you can always reach out to our office and we can kind of help mediate that and say, no, this really should count. You should be getting your aid for that. Um, still a work in progress, but that's really where we come into play with the financial aid. Um, and then the last two, the Bursar and the Registrar's Office, um, very, very useful offices. Bursar is gonna handle everything with your bill, um, with your tuition, if you get a bill and it looks weird, um, that's who you're going to want to talk to. Um, you know, maybe something happens with residency in state versus out of state or something like that. That's where that will go. And then the registrar's office um, will handle kind of everything with your transcript. We will submit some forms if we have to add something. They mentioned maybe a cognate um, or doing something in like a certificate. If we want to add the certificate to your degree, that kind of goes to the registrar's office um, to make sure things are showing properly on your transcript. Um, so we can always direct you to them or help you figure out what you got to do to get things on there. Um, I'm sure there's other things out there, other resources, other offices that you might use, but those are kind of the main ones. Um, and then as always, if there's ever anything else and you're not sure where to go, you can always come to us and we will direct you to the right place. Next. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all presenters. It was great uh, presentation. And then now it is your turn. And if you have any questions, please just type your questions in the chat box. We're gonna just uh, take care of the questions in order that we receive. Please feel free just to type your questions in the chat box. Okay, while we are waiting for the questions, I would appreciate if the other faculty members, if they like, they can 
introduce themselves and the research interest that they follow uh, because some applicants they may be interested to work with you I can go ahead and answer that first question. Um, Please. So, um, uh, sorry, Jasmine, uh, because the chat box may not be appear for everyone. I would appreciate if you can adjust. The question is that, does the university offer application fee waiver? Yes. So um, there may be the opportunity for a fee waiver depending on when you are looking to get started. But for the fall 2024, um, start term, the application is actually waived. So you don't have to worry about an application fee for the fall 2024 term. Now, if you are looking for a future start date, maybe fall of 2025, that is something that we can discuss. But as far as um, fall 24, you don't have to worry about any application fees. Thank you. We have another question, probably Jasmine, you can answer it. Uh, uh, the question is that, please, does the graduate assistant cover for the full tuition fee? So it does not cover the full tuition fee. Um, Ellen, can you piggyback and give the, I, I believe, the exact price that you or the amount that it covers? Yeah. Um, so we had on there, um, it offers a, a stipend of um, $20,000 for the nine month academic year. There is a tuition supplement. I don't have the exact number. I'm sorry to say. Um, and then if you are in state or I'm sorry, if you're, if you're an out of state resident, you kind of drop down to the in state. So you would be in state tuition minus the stipend. Um, but there would be a little bit left over. It's not, it's not a full tuition um, waiver. Yeah, let me just elaborate it more. Uh, we we try to just make the offer uh, a little bit competitive and then help the students to just cover most of the things, but depends on the budget every year. And the tuition, the, the fellowship is going to help us a lot uh, as a, more extra money to supplement that. And if uh, you're going to work with the faculty members that they have external funding, that can be helpful as well for the summer salary or anything else that can help you to have, uh, you know, more uh, stipend. And the other question that received here is, are the students automatically considered for the fellowship? Depends on the nature of fellowship. R&D committee will decide uh, based on the merit and uh, the qualification of the applicant after the admission to just send their applications. And it is from the, it's gonna go from the R&D committee. Uh, and we try to match uh, the strong candidates and uh, to the fellowship opportunities that they are here. The other question is that, is there a separate application for graduate assistantship? Uh, mm, yes and no. When we offer you uh, um, a PhD position here, it's going to come with details of the financial. But every semester, you need to apply for the uh, GA sheet that you're going to work. And it is more administrative task that you need to do. But while you are in the program, the offer letter, by default, going to come with the graduate assistant sheet. And for those that they're going to admit it with the, let's say, uh, the, the scholarship. But we have admission without scholarship, too. Depends on the budget uh, and the number of the applicants. Please type your questions if you have any extra questions in the chat box. We're going to just look at it. Okay, it seems that while we are waiting for the questions, uh, 
I want to ask Dr. Ketzi and Dr. Freeberg if they like and if it is possible for them to introduce themselves for to the uh, audience and the potential uh, applicants that they like to work with them. Okay, we received another question. It said that, may I write the name of advisor in SOP? Uh, we encourage you to go the, to the faculty members uh, profile and then review their research interests, their publications, and see who is the potential advisor that you like to work with. Yes, it would be a plus if you can just articulate who you're gonna work with as a potential advisor. The other question is that, please, what do you expect in a statement of purpose? You need to just, in the statement of purpose, you need to just highlight the research interests, your background. And if you're going to search online, there are a lot of examples of a statement of purpose. But uh, the research interests, why South Carolina? And then who, wh who going to you potential advisors you're going to work with? That's the main things that I can think of, but the other faculties can chime in and add other points. There is another question said that, does professor offer TARA assistantship separately? Uh, no, uh, the graduate assistantship gonna come from the school. And uh, this is uh, the, all the funding package that gonna come through the school. And it's gonna just clearly mention in the offer letter. We have another question. When should I expect the admission decision? We review the applications uh, in uh, February, and we do our best. Depend on depends on the schedule and the plan of the R and D committee. Usually, uh, late February, February, early March, we decide, and we inform the potential, uh, you know, students that they gonna join us with the offer letter. Okay, we have eight minutes. Please just type your questions uh, if you have any extra questions. Vanessa and Darin, do you like to just introduce yourself? I was uh, trying to throw that into Darren's court, the ball, um, but <laughs> I'm happy to. Um, hey, everybody, my name is Vanessa Kitsi. I'm an associate professor here at the iSchool. Um, I've been on the research and doctoral committee in the past, and I work with doctoral students. Um, my research is kind of answering the social question of information science. So how do people uh, create, seek, share, and use information to help them in their daily lives. Um, and I particularly try to answer that question through the lens of um, the experiences of LGBTQ communities um, and within the context of health information. Um, so yeah, I like to do research with students. It's fun. Um, and yeah, hoping you'll consider our program. Hey, everybody. Sorry, I, I was talking for a while before, um, and apparently my mic is not working. <laughs> so, um, 
I am Darren Freeberg, and I'm an associate professor here in the iSchool. Um, my, my research is generally concerned with the workplace, um, information behavior at work, knowledge management, things like that. Um, I've recently been looking a lot more at public libraries and public library staff, trying to figure out some of the attrition problems, um, particularly now as as library staff are are targeted and 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 seen as the villains for a lot of the what we would consider really great work that they're doing. Um, and recently, as you were working on a, a an IMLS funded project that's looking, at public libraries and routine work and sort of what that looks like and some barriers in that. Um, but just like Dr. Kitsy, I, I am always looking to work with students. Um, I've I've taught uh, 801, um, which is sort of our, our intro theory class for the doc program. I've also taught 805, which is the um, policy um, ethics course. So you'll probably see me around at some point. Thank you very much. I appreciate Darren and Vanessa. And uh, Rachel and Faley, if you like to introduce your research area and willingness to work with the PhD students, I would appreciate to just briefly introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, I can go first since uh, my, my work is uh, tangentially related to, to Darren's recent interest in public libraries. Um, I'm a public libraries person, so I look at public library services for people in crisis and uh, the ways in which uh, public library staff, um, you know, interact with people experiencing a variety of crises like um, uh, homelessness, uh, mental health concerns, um, substance use, uh, things like that, and the, the toll that it takes on public library workers and how uh, we can bring in skills from other fields such as social work to support the well-being of public library staff and support their ability to, to handle these really difficult situations. So um, I'm also always interested in working with students who are interested in uh, services for people in crisis and uh, public librarianship. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Feli Tu Kiefer. Uh, I am an associate professor at the I School. My career, uh, my in uh, my research interests, pretty much centered on two um, on two things. First is the house communication, house librarianship, and the evidence based house uh, information access. Uh, and the digital health literacy. Uh, I am also a World Health Org and the CDC trained infodemic manager. Uh, as other colleagues have already said that I really like working uh, with students. And I think that it's always very rewarding uh, in working with students. Uh, another part of my research is actually uh, about the disaster health, uh, disaster information services provided by local public libraries to their communities. So I have already started uh, studied um, floods, hurricane, um, wildfire. And then I'm going to study tornado uh, this year, pretty much approaching to the end of the year. And then hopefully next year, I will uh, study earthquake. So of course, and I feel like local public libraries are always the center of the community. And I wanted to prove the values um, to government agencies and the public health agencies. So that's the way, and I do that. Well, no, I am, so it's Dr. Freeber said that, I am going to go to California to study the places where <laughs> have already suffered uh, uh, from earthquake. So just be clarify about this. Um, and- No, I'm just giving you a hard time. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> Always. You see, we get along, folks. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, another thing that I would like to say is I have already worked with uh, several students who now uh, are, are researchers uh, um, uh, in their field. So, and I think that um, when you wanted to uh, consider your topics in a wide range of subject areas, we have covered in a lot of areas on our faculty. And I am also the uh, advisor, one of the faculty advisor of our house communication certificate program. So if you are interested in this, please contact me. You can easily find my profile on our iSchools website. So thank you and hopefully you will join us. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are almost done. I am a son. Uh, just feel free to contact me because I am the chair of research and doctoral committee. My email address is ehsan2 at sc.edu. Uh, it's all my pleasure to just uh, having you all here today and we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.